It occurred to me when you even said a little bit of that, Alex, that many of us, uh, you know, you and I would take for granted some of the lingo involved here, sequencing and, and, and you know, what's involved. But I, th I still think it might be a bit of a black box to some people listening. And given the, 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 the topics we're going to cover today, I, I think just explaining to people, you know, for example, what was done in the late 90s, early 2000s, when quote unquote, the human genome was sequenced. What does that mean? And how had that changed from the very first time it was done by sure, you know, sheer brute force in the most analog way until even when you arrived, um, you know, 10, 11 years ago. So, so maybe walk us through what it actually means to, to sequence a genome and, and feel free to also throw in a little bit of background about you know, some of the basics of DNA and the structure, et cetera, as it pertains to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's, it's really important fundamental stuff. Um, so yeah, so a uh, quick, quick primer on, uh, you know, human genetics. So, you know, in, in most cells of the body, you know, uh, you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, they're very similar except the X and Y chromosome, which are obviously, uh, different in, in men and women. Um, if you were, you know, each one of those uh, chromosomes, right, is actually a, a lot of DNA packed together in a very orderly way, um, where the DNA is wrapped around, chroma, you know, proteins called um, nucleosomes, uh, which are composed of histones, and then it's packed into something called chromatin, which is this mass of DNA and proteins, and again, packed together, and then you make these units of, of chromosomes. Now, if you were to unwind all of those um, chromosomes, right? Like a, a you know, pull the, the string on the sweater and completely unwind it. And you were to line all of them kind of end to end, right? Um, you would have 3 billion individual bases, right? So the, the ATCG code, right? At any given of the, one of those 3 billion positions, you would have a string of letters. Um, uh, you know, each one would either be ATC or G and it would be 3 billion long. So to sequence a whole human genome is to read out that code for an individual, right? And once you do that, you then know the their particular code at um, you know each of those uh, positions. Um, so um, you know, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the last century, um, that was considered a quite a daunting task. But uh, you know, as I think our country is is often done decided that it was a very worthy one to do, uh, along with several other um, kind of leading uh, you know, countries that believe strongly in science. And so they funded the Human Genome Project. So all over the world at centers, people were trying to sequence bits of this 3 billion uh, bases to comprise the first human, um, complete human genome. Um, uh, so it's just quite famous. There were two efforts. One was a public effort led by the NIH uh, and Francis Collin at the times. Um, and um, they had a particular approach where what they were doing was they were cutting out large um, sections of the genome uh, and then um, using a uh, an older type of sequencing mes method called um, capillary electrophoresis to sequence um, each of those individual bases. Um, uh, there was a private effort um, led by Craig Venter um, and a company called Solera um, which took a very different approach, which is they cut up the genome into much, much smaller pieces, um, pieces that were, were so small that, you know, you didn't necessarily what, know a priori what part of the genome they could they, they would come from, which is why they were doing this longer, more laborious process through the public effort. Um, but they there was a big innovation, which is they realized that if you had enough of these fragments, you could, using a mathematical technique, reconstruct it from these individual pieces, right? Where you could take individual pieces, looked at where they overlap. And again, we're talking about billions of fragments here, and you can imagine mathematically reconstructing that. Um, very computationally intensive, very complex. But the benefit of that is that you could generate the data much, much faster. And so um, in a fraction of the time and for a fraction of the money, they actually caught up to the public effort and then culminated in um, each having a, um, a draft of the human genome around the same time in um, late 2000, early 2001, and then simultaneously in Nature and Science, we got the first draft of the human genome, uh, you know, a milestone in, 
in uh, in science. And, and Alex, what were the approximate lengths of the fragments that Solera was um, breaking DNA down into? Yeah. Um, so th they were taking chunks out in individual like megabases, so like a um, you know a, a million um, bases at a time, and then they would isolate that and then deconstruct it even to smaller pieces. Um, which were kilobase uh, fragments, so um, a thousand bases at a time. And again, so they would kind of take a piece of the puzzle, um, but they would know which piece it was, and then break that into smaller and smaller ones. And then after you had the one kilobase sequences, they would put it all back together. Got it. Versus um, uh, just to contrast that with the private effort, which they called shotgun sequencing, which is you just you know took the whole thing, ground it up brute force sequenced it and then use the informatics to figure out what went where and in the shotgun how small were they broken down into they got down to um uh you know kilobase and hundred base uh you know multi hundred base fragments um uh but the key was all you had to do was just brute force keep sequencing as opposed to this more artisanal approach of trying to take individual pieces mm -hmm. and deconstruct them and then reconstruct them so it's early 2001, this gets published. By the way, do we know the identity of the individual? I think we do know the identity of the individual who was sequenced, don't we? I, I can't recall. Uh, I think the original one was uh, is still anonymous and, and likely to be a composite of, of multiple individuals just because of the amount of DNA. That was soon needed, after, yeah. Mm. Yeah, soon after there were individuals. So um, Craig Ventner, um, you know, uh, you know public, he was one of the, he may have been the first, you know, individual who is named uh, that we had the, the genome for. Got it. It's often been said, Alex, that that effort um, mm -hmm. costs about, like at the end of that sequencing, if you decided I want to now do one more person, it would cost a billion dollars directionally to do that effort. So what was the state of the art in transitioning that from where it was, let's just say, order of magnitude, 10 to the $9 per sequence, to where it was 10 years later, approximately. What was, what was the technology introduction, or plural version of that question, that led to a reduction, and um, how many logs did it improve by? Yeah, so the, the number that, and we went back and did this analysis. So if, if you literally at the end of the original human genome said, hey, I want to do one more, and you have the benefit of all the learnings, right, from, from the previous one, uh, a few hundred million dollars um, would have been an incremental genome. Got it. By um, 2012, it was, you know, on the order of low tens of thousands of dollars, right? So, um, uh you know, let's call that, you know, four, you know, four or five logs of improvement. And what brought that? So the day you show up at Illumina and it's, you know, if, if for research purposes or if, you know, a very wealthy individual said, I have to know my, my whole genome sequence and they were willing to pay $25,000 for it or a, a lab was doing it as part of, you know, a, a clinical trial or for research. Um, what were they buying from Illumina to make that happen? Yeah, yeah. So it was a series of inventions that allowed the sequencing reactions to be miniaturized. Um, and then you could do, you know, orders of magnitude, more sequencing uh, of, uh, of DNA by miniaturizing it. Um, and so, um, you know, the older sequencers, they had a, a small glass tube. And as the DNA went through, you sequenced it. Um, it got converted into a 2D format, kind of like a glass slide, where you had tiny um, uh, fragments of DNA stuck to it, you know, um, uh, hundreds of millions, then ultimately billions. And then you sequenced all of them simultaneously. So there was a huge miniaturization of um, each individual sequencing reaction, which allowed you to just, you know, in, in one system generate many, many more um, DNA sequences at the same time. Um, you know, uh, there's a very important chemistry that was developed called sequencing by by synthesis uh, by a, a Cambridge chemist uh, uh, who, I, who I know well, Shankar Balasubramanian, and he developed uh, Illumina sequencing chemistry, 
which um, which ultimately went through a company called Selexa, which Illumina acquired, um, and that has generated the world the majority of the world's genomics uh, data, um, the the original chemistry that uh, he developed in Cambridge. And what was it about that chemistry that was such a step forward? It allowed you to to miniaturize um, the sequencing reactions, um, so you could have a huge number, ultimately billions, in a in a very small glass slide. It also allowed you to do something. Um, uh, which is called cyclic uh, sequencing uh, in a very precise uh, and efficient and, and fast way where you read off one base at a time uh, and you can control it. And so you imagine you have, say, a lawn of a billion DNA fragments and you're on base three on every single fragment and you want to know what base four is on every fragment. It allowed you to simultaneously sequence just one more base on all billion fragments, read it out across your whole lawn, and then um, once you read it out, add one more base, read it all out. Um, and so this allowed for this huge parallelization.